Hi guys, this is Crystal again with At Home Nursing Care. We're going to discuss ALS. This is part two. Um, today we'll be discussing common issues and adaptations um, for caring for patients or clients with ALS. As a review, ALS stands for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It is a, a neurodegenerative disease when the nerves in the brain and the spinal cord stop communicating to the muscles and the muscles begin to waste away because they're not being used. Um, this is a very difficult diagnosis to receive. Usually people have uh, are given two to five years to live on average, um, sometimes less um, and sometimes more. Um, it's a progressive disease where uh, it's always fatal. It might start out as weakness in the hand or difficulty swallowing, and it leads to um, difficulty eating, talking, walking. Um, a lot of clients in the end are wheelchair bound, maybe with a tracheostomy and a feeding tube. Um, so even within those two to five years, they're, they're difficult. They can be difficult years, um, especially towards the end. Um, it's a random disease, uh, meaning it can affect anyone, even at any age, um, up to 90 to 95% have no family history um, of ALS. And so it really can just affect anyone. They have not found a cause. Um, veterans are known to be at least twice as likely to be diagnosed with ALS. Again, they're not sure why. There's some theories on maybe it's related to um, environmental exposures, um, but they're just not sure. Um, it usually strikes people between the age of 40 and 70, but a lot of people are diagnosed in their 20s and 30s. Um, Stephen Hawking, the famous physicist, he was diagnosed at age 21, so it really can happen to anyone. Um, the importance of quality of life um, is adapting, being able to adapt um, with devices or tools at home. And that is something as caregivers, we can help out with, um, with our clients and in order to help them live a better life at home. Um, so we're going to kind of review what a caregiving role would look like as the nurse and then as a caregiver. So as a nurse, you might be managing a tracheostomy if they reach that stage where they need help breathing um, through a tube that goes into um, using a ventilator, either invasive ventilation at home or non-invasive like a BiPAP um, or helping with suctioning out secretions, either through the tracheostomy or even just oral secretions um, that they are having difficulty managing, um, providing nutrition and medication through a feeding tube or um, helping them to practice safe swallowing, um, management of medications like breathing treatments, um, IV medications and even oral medications, um, bowel programs. Oftentimes um, they're on a regular bowel, a bowel program to keep their bowel movements regular. So that's something as the nurse, we can help keep track of when are they having bowel movements and do they need further assistance? Um, assistance with communication. So a lot of quality of life is again, being able to adapt. So a lot of these clients are slowly losing their ability to speak. Um, their voices will become slurred, they'll become weak. And so maybe later in the day, they can't um, be heard or understood. And so they'll use um, like writing boards or an iPad um, or even um, a high tech something uh, machine or device called an eye gaze where they communicate with their eye movement. Um, and so it's important that we help them use these adaptive tools and give them time to, <clears throat> to write out what they want. So a lot of clients talk about how, or a lot of ALS patients talk about how frustrating it can be when um, they're in the middle of writing their response and someone interrupts them. And so then they have to erase the response. So it's important with all of our clients, um, including our ALS clients, that we give them time to communicate with us. And a lot of what we discussed today will translate to our other um, clients that have neurodegenerative diseases or um, neurological disorders like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, even just the elderly um, as they lose function, it's important to um, give them time and patience. So as the caregiver, you're going to be helping them communicate and again, giving them time um, to utilize these tools that help them communicate. Um, sometimes they'll use like a speakerphone to help their voice be louder so they can be heard. Of course, they want to use their voice as long as they possibly can. Um, dressing and grooming, that's something we can help with. There's usually things like Velcro um, shirts and, and pants that make it easier to come on and off. Um, 
bathing, you know, like our elderly clients, you know, they might use a shower chair or just they might get to the point where they have to shower in bed. So those are things we can help with as caregivers, um, meal preparation. It's really important when you first meet with this client that you discuss what their goals are. Um, something we can do that particularly helps with ALS clients and a lot of our other clients is to help them conserve energy. So we can take over some of the roles that either the family's been doing or the clients have been doing themselves to give them more energy to to a lot to other things they might want to do. And so, um, you know, that's the discussion you want to have in the beginning when you meet with this client to see what their goals are. Some of our clients want to maintain their ability to meal prep. So if you're coming every day, they don't want, um, some of them wouldn't want you to meal prep for them because they don't want to lose that independence. Um, but a lot of them do, uh, appreciate that from us. So it's just an important conversation to have when you first meet with a new client, um, any client light housekeeping, shopping errands. These are all ways we can help them conserve energy, transportation. Um, be mindful that um, the clients that we're providing respite care for, meaning we are giving, um, we're alleviating some of the, the care from the 24 hour family member or caregiver um, that might need a break. And so say, you know, the wife is the 24 hour caregiver and she's leaving while you're taking care of the client. Um, it would be nice if we could talk to the wife and, and say, you know, what is it that I can do to help offload aside from just being here? What can I do to help offload some of the burden of being a 24 hour caregiver to help lighten your load a little bit? Um, so just be mindful of that with any of our clients we're providing respite care to. Um, so one um, symptom that clients with ALS have um, or eventually do have is it leads to what seems like excessive um, saliva production or, or drooling. It's not necessarily excessive um, saliva production, but they just don't have, they're losing their, their muscles and their ability to swallow. And so it just accumulates and, and leads up to drooling. Their jaw muscles are also getting weaker. And so their mouth might be agape, just wide open. And then the, the saliva just falls out. So on average, you know, you and I produce one and a half liters of saliva a day. Sounds kind of gross. We don't think about it because we just are swallowing it throughout the day, moistening our throats and everything. We don't think about it. Um, but people with ALS, they are losing their ability to swallow. So it just builds up and um, they need assistance with um, mean, managing the saliva that's normally produced. So, um, it can be very frustrating and embarrassing to these clients when, um, they're drooling and they can't manage these things. Um, it can also lead to choking and aspiration, which can be, um, life threatening if it leads to pneumonia. So that's something to be aware of. There's some things we can do to take action to help with these clients is, um, some of these clients will be taught, they'll, they'll work with a speech language pathologist, um, that help them use tools to manage their swallowing. Um, so they might do what they call this a, like a very conscious uh, swallowing decision where they, they remind themselves to swallow and then it can help just that conscious decision. You know, we do it without thinking about it, but if they do it more consciously, um, they can help manage those secretions that way. Um, in the bottom, you'll see a suction device. A lot of these can be, um, ordered for the home. And it's kind of like at the dentist where you just spit into the little tube. And so as caregivers, if they're losing some of their mobility in their arms, we can help suction um, their mouths while um, they're talking or eating. And, and that will help get rid of some of the excess secretions. Um, we can avoid sweet or very sour foods for these clients to help prevent excess secretions of um, saliva. And um, there are some medications as well that can help us manage it. Um, so medications can be used independently or in combination to assist with um, this issue. It's a very common issue um, with ALS patients. Um, just to familiarize ourselves with some of these medications, um, you'll see them a lot with our end of life patients on hospice. They too have difficulty managing their secretions. So you might've heard of some of these medications like glycopyrrolate um, and scopolamine patches. Um, Propantheon, uh, it's, these are pills that can be used before meals. And then amitriptyline is an antidepressant, but it can also be used for this purpose. Um, the scopolamine patches we see a lot with our hospice patients. They, um, that way they don't have to swallow the pills. It's a patch that goes maybe on the back of the neck, somewhere on the skin, can be left on 
um, for 72 hours. Um, just as a caution, it can cause glaucoma in patients that already have vision issues. Um, some common side effects of these medications are sedation, um, dizziness, difficulty urinating, and tachycardia. So those are things to take into effect. A lot of um, ALS clients talk about dry mouth from these medications. So it's um, the far end, you know, do I want to drool or dry mouth? Um, so just be aware of that. They might need some frequent little sips of water to help lubricate their mouth, keep it from getting too dry, um, as well as their lips. Um, if all these are ineffective or they're just not the tools that the client likes, uh, Botox is another option. Um, so things we can do to help with thick saliva and mucus. So mucus um, getting thick is a very big issue for ALS clients because they lose their muscles and their um, intercostal muscles between their law, uh, between their rib cages and in their diaphragm. So their cough is really weak. So dealing with mucus um, is very challenging for them. So um, things we can do to help thin out the liquids or the mucus is, is helpful for these clients, like um, increasing liquid or hydration. If they aren't able to swallow water well, or they don't like the thickened liquids, then we can do like popsicles or soups, um, things that have higher um, fruits, smoothies, things that have a lot of um, water in them that are easier to swallow. Um, water can be difficult. So a lot of people don't think about this with people that have difficulty swallowing, but the thin liquids are more difficult to swallow than the thicker liquids um, or like smoothies and, and mechanical soft foods like mashed potatoes or blended foods. Um, so just something to think about. Um, humidification can help reduce secretion. So they can have a 24 hour humidifier in their house reducing dairy intake because that can cause more mucus production. Um, medications can help thin out secretions. So either oral medications or a nebulizer to thin out these secretions will help these clients. Um, medical devices for severe issues um, include a high frequency chest wall oscillator device. You'll see a picture later and a cough assist device. So these devices will help um, vibrate and shake up those secretions, break them up so they can help get them up. Um, the cough assist device will help give them that pressure that a normal cough would um, as they cough to get the secretions up and out of their lungs. Um, other mouth issues to consider are excessive yawning. A lot of these clients, it leads to that. Um, and it's from their diaphragm, just not working appropriately. And so chewing candy or gum can sometimes help alleviate that symptom. Um, jaw quivering or clenching. Um, so these muscles are breaking down and they can sometimes become spastic. So they either they lose function or they become spastic where they get really tight. Um, so Botox can sometimes help with that. Um, a, lind a laryngeal spasm it can be a life-threatening um, issue that occurs where the closure of the vocal cords stop airflow, and it can be caused by acid reflux or irritants like perfume or, or even foods. So the response you would want to take if they were having difficulty breathing is reposition the head and neck upright and position the jaw forward to try to open up that airway and give them as much um, room as possible. Um, and then of course, if they're having difficulty, you want to alert um, EMS or something like that to, to help them out, depending on what their, their goals of care are. Um, thrush is something to watch out for. So fungal infection, um, these happen in a lot of our clients, especially clients that are on antibiotics. So if you ever notice like a white patch on their tongue or in their mouth, um, then, or a white layer over their tongue, then we want to alert um, their primary caregiver or their physician so they can get on some antifungal treatment for that. Respiratory symptoms. Um, so most people with ALS, they end up dying uh, from um, the inability to breathe on their own. And so a lot of them at end of life will go to um, breathing devices. Some of them decide to get a tracheostomy. Some people don't want to go that route. Um, but this is usually the cause of death for ALS patients. Um, so the main muscle for breathing is the diaphragm. We'll see a picture below, but it sits under the, the rib cage and it helps us expand and contract. And with these ALS patients, that muscle is deteriorating. So they're not able to use it anymore. So their coughs are really weak. Their breathing becomes shallow. Um, and so this will lead to more and more issues as time goes on and they lose that function of the diaphragm. <clears throat> 
so as you can see there in the picture that the pink below the, the lungs there is the diaphragm. It helps us expand and contract our lungs and um, gives us more capacity. So when um, ALS patients are diagnosed, they will perform lung function tests to see how much capacity of their lungs they use. And as time goes on, they'll lose more and more of that. And based on those numbers, decide how they want to treat, you know, do we want to go to, um, you know, the BiPAP during at night to help them rest. Um, and so that does some of the work for them. You know, it's a lot of work of breathing uh, for them more than you or I. So why you and I don't even think about breathing, they have to make a more conscious effort to breathe um, and they're aware of it. And so a time goes on, they have to make those decisions on how far they wanna go to adapt. Do they want a tracheostomy? Um, so a lot of respiratory symptoms show up um, at night. They're more subtle during the day. So they might not have um, significant short of breath during the day and don't realize it, but laying down is tough or during the night they wake up out of breath, kind of like a sleep apnea uh, patient. And um, these are signs that more action, you know, things are progressing in, in the disease and that they might need to take more action. Um, like wearing a BiPAP at night, you see in the picture that woman is wearing a nasal BiPAP, they have full face BiPAPs. Um, and then, um, more invasively, they can go on a ventilator at night to give them rest um, if they have a tracheostomy. Dyspnea is a term to use, uh, we use to describe difficulty um, or discomfort breathing. And so if you notice that the client is breathing fast or just having to take breaths between talking, they can't talk, um, like say a full sentence without stopping to take a breath, then these are signs that things are, um, are, are getting hard for them to breathe. Um, Patient, ALS patients may feel intense air hunger, like labored breathing. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. If you notice and you're the only one there, it's something new, we wanna report that because um, they might need to take more actions. They might need to be on medications to help with these sorts of things. Um, we can help them adapt um, with medications, treatments, and then also just at home, a lot of these clients will um, sleep in recliners um, or sleep upright, laying flat is harder on them because the lungs have to work harder to expand. And so um, sitting upright will help these clients a lot of times. So treatment options on the top right corner, you'll see the chest wall oscillator. That's what it looks like. Um, the next picture down is a nasal BiPAP. And then the last picture on the bottom there is a tracheostomy, what that looks like. So um, that's usually a big decision for these clients. Um, it'll, Airway clearing devices like chest physiotherapy, high frequency chest wall oscillator and suction and cough assist devices help. So if your client is using one of those, it's important that you learn um, if it's within your scope that you're allowed to use those and help them with those and how to do those appropriately and safely. Um, so if they are on any adapted devices, you wanna make sure that you're being trained on how to utilize those, um, especially if you're gonna be the only one there left with them. So you can help them, um, you know, it can, it can save them their life. A lot of people have um, mucus plugs where the mucus will get stuck in their airway and then they have no way to pass air. Um, if they don't have a ventilator, then that can end up cause killing them at that point. So it's really important we, we know how to utilize these devices. Um, like I said, inclined support will often help like raising the head of the bed or sleeping in a, in a chair. Um, breath stacking is an exercise they can do to help expand their lungs. Um, it's where they take one breath on top of the other. They'll usually be working with um, a, a full team. Um, so if people diagnosed with ALS will usually be seen at an ALS clinic. Um, that is the goal anyway. And to get a multidisciplinary team on them, like a pulmonologist or a lung doctor, um, physical therapist, and and um, speech language therapists. So they should be teaching them these exercises and we at home can help them perform these exercises. So again, if they've been prescribed these exercises to do at home, it's important to learn that you're trained and you're, you learn how to um, assist them in performing these exercises. So um, can give them a better chance of, of living well at home. Um, Non-invasive ventilation. And these right here are, respiratory equipment, I just wanted you guys to see and become a little bit familiar with. Um, at the top is a bi-level machine or a BiPAP, looks similar to a CPAP, a lot of our clients are on for uh, sleep apnea. Uh, portable ventilator, so patients that get a tracheostomy, they can um, take these and be mobile with them. Uh, cough assist device is something um, they might use 
for again helping them get those secretions out and um, the multifunction ventilator serves as all of the above it has a, a cough assist device suction and a ventilator all in one so um, I think the most difficult thing for these patients is getting um, approved by their insurance to get these things um, I heard or I read that um, in throughout their diagnosis they're allotted one um, communication assistive device. And so they have to decide <clears throat> which one is gonna work for them best and they won't be approved for another one. And these things can cost several thousand dollars. So um, <clears throat> symptom of difficulty swallowing is uh, pretty much inevitable with these patients. Um, so the symptom is known as dysphagia or difficulty swallowing. Um, and the risk is for aspiration or um, swallowing food or fluid into the lungs on accident. It's, a lot, it's happened to all of us at some point in our life, but um, these patients, it can happen too frequently. And um, the risk is that they can't cough it up and out and whatever they that went into their lungs can build up bacteria and cause, cause aspiration pneumonia. So, um, all of our clients that have difficulty swallowing are at risk for aspiration pneumonia. And there are steps we can take to help prevent that from happening. So um, we'll kind of talk about um, the act of swallowing is a complex process of 26 pairs of muscles and five cranial nerves working together. People think, you know, swallowing is really easy, but it's actually a pretty complex process. Um, and so when these things start to fade, these muscles start to go out, um, it leads to several different pathways of difficulty swallowing. Um, these ALS clients are monitored by a speech language pathologist, often working with them. So as um, their symptoms get worse, they might need to go in and be reevaluated. So if you notice a big change in them, um, you know, it might vary a little bit day to day, but if you know a consistent decline in their ability to swallow, then we want to adapt at home. Um, and we want to make sure they're um, going back into their speech uh, language pathologist and getting reevaluated after these they've lost some function. So some red flags um, to watch out for for swallowing impairment are coughing and choking on food or liquid while swallowing. Again, this translates to all of our clients. So if you notice every time you give them a sip of water or every time they take a bite, they're coughing, um, you know, once here and there it might happen. But if you're noticing it's consistently happening after each bite, then they need to stop eating. And um, we need to let, you know, you know, their primary caregiver know, the nurse know, the physician know, whoever um, that can help elicit more um, evaluation. And then um, maybe modify their diet in between, you know, say they have to go in for a speech or a barium swallow test um, where they get their swallow evaluated. Then in the meantime, we want to adapt and, um, you know, maybe go on a mechanical soft diet or, um, you know, whatever we can do, make sure they're sitting upright and not laying back in the bed. Um, so there are ways to adapt. Other signs are wet or gurgling sounding voice immediately after swallowing. So maybe they're not coughing because they have a weak cough, but they sound like there's some fluid in there every time they talk. Um, food escaping out of their mouth when they're chewing. So as they're chewing, like food and liquids falling out of their mouth, um, or they get short of breath, or um, they vomit after eating. These are all red flag signs that we need to get their swallow evaluated. Um, so treatments, um, we want to meet with the speech language pathologist to get their expert advice and report changes, but some things they might do are diet modification, um, like altering the consistency of the food. So like I said earlier, thin liquids are harder to swallow, thicker liquids are easier. So, um, in the top right corner, you can see the thicket thickener. That's just some generic brand of thickener you just powder in um, and they will tell you what consistency. So some clients, they need like a honey thickened um, liquids and then some need nectar thickened. So it's important that we know and differentiate that because we want to make sure that we are getting it thick enough um, to where it's helping them swallow safely. Um, moistening foods with so uh, sauces and gravies for lubrication. Um, often helps smaller bites and sips between bites um, will help the food go down because their muscles aren't able to push it all the way down. So um, some taking sips of water between will sometimes help a uh, chin tuck while swallowing or an effort, effortful swallow. That effortful swallow is what I mentioned earlier where they're consciously making the decision. The chin tuck is where you tuck it in and uh, like say they have to swallow pills and it's kind of hard for them. Um, you'd want to remind them to tuck their, ten, uh, tuck their chin in and swallow that way. Um, blended food, 
So getting a blender for them might help them uh, avoid the, the feeding tube for longer. And then small, easy meals throughout the day. They often get tired uh, because it's such a process and, and it's so challenging to eat. They often don't eat enough. Um, and they're actually burning more calories than you or I, just because it takes more energy to do, perform any tasks. So important for them to eat high calorie um, foods, high quality foods and little portions throughout the day, if that's the case. And then going to a feeding tube, um, like pictured below, um, where the tube goes straight into their stomach and, and they can nurse can administer or primary caregiver, not, um, not at home nursing care caregiver, um, can administer food or medications through the tubes. Um, some nutritional issues, ALS is difficult to take in enough food or liquids, again, because they get so tired, swallowing is difficult to take a long time because it's so much effort, um, people feel full early and difficulty preparing meals because they tire out quickly, these are all issues that lead to malnutrition, weight loss, and dehydration. Um, so um, some things we can do to help alleviate that is um, reduce anything that might be decreasing their appetite, like herbal supplements. Um, caregivers can take some of the work out by preparing their food um, and then also up small, you know, however they like it and are able to swallow it and even feeding them um, can help takes the energy away from the process of getting the food to the mouth. And um, then all they have to focus on is chewing or swallowing the food. Um, even blended food that can take away the work of chewing. So that's something to discuss with them if they like that and if, if it's helping them get in more calories. Um, meals are social, but ALS patients and really any patients with difficulty swallowing should not be talking while they're eating just because it leads to more risk of aspiration. So just remind your clients that have any difficulty swallowing um, that it's best to focus on chewing and swallowing while they're eating and don't try to start up conversations while they're eating um, as the caregiver, just give them time. Um, provide softer and moister foods that are easier to swallow. Um, some high calorie, high nutrition foods are like extra virgin olive oil drizzled over foods at the end will help moisten it. And it has calories that are good calories. Um, Avocado, if it's smashed up, it's easier to swallow. And it's also high calorie, high fat, um, good food for them. Eating smaller meals throughout the day, um, blended foods or protein drinks like Ensure Boost um, or just doing blended smoothies. Um, <clears throat> just making sure to get their calories in. Butters and sauces will add um, calories evaluation by speech language pathologist, um, will help. They should usually give them some, some tips and tools on how to eat, um, in enough calories and what their goal calorie intake is for the day to keep them from losing weight. Um, like we discussed their speeding tubes. Here's another picture of what it looks like. Um, caregivers cannot administer food or medications through there, but, um, family caregivers can, uh, private caregivers might be able to do that. And then a nursing can, um, so many people with ALS choose to go to a feeding tube, either to completely um, take over their food intake if they aren't able to swallow safely at all, or just to supplement, you know, this, they might still be eating a little bit here and there, but not enough to um, maintain their weight. And so they might decide to get this feeding tube to help with that. And it really does um, end up prolonging life. Um, not all the time, but um, they have found that patients with ALS who are able to maintain their weight do live longer. Um, balance water issues can become um, a problem later on. So urinary urgency or frequency. Um, urgency is when they don't get much warning. When they have to go, they have to go. Um, or frequency is when they have to go several times throughout the day and it's low volumes. Um, that's something that happens commonly as they lose that function or have spasticity bladder spasticity. So um, it often leads to incontinence. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, there are some treatments that may include diet, um, scheduled toileting, pelvic floor exercises, um, protective undergarments like briefs um, and medications. Diet um, adjustments we can help them make are certain foods 
avoiding certain foods that um, make the condition worse by acting as a diuretic or irritant um, to the bladder is el eliminating coffee or caffeine and um, alcoholic beverages and reducing carbonated beverages and um, avoiding foods high in acid like orange juice, tomatoes, or that contain a large amount of potassium. Scheduled toileting is a tool we can use to help prevent incontinence or um, at least minimize it by, um, you know, maybe set, they set a clock um, every three hours. We're going to the bathroom, even if they don't have the sensation, they go anyway. So a lot of our clients will get on this, even um, our elderly clients, because they lose partial function of their bladder. And this will help them from having so much urinary incontinence. So every three hours, like clockwork, they go to the toilet, you assist them to the toilet, um, even again, if they don't have that sensation to go. And that will help train the bladder um, to go at those times and they're less likely to leak in between. Um, and this can help with their quality of life, you know, less embarrassment and um, less incontinence. Pelvic floor exercises like the Kegel exercises can help them tighten those muscles, whatever function they do have, it can build upon that. So that's something you can remind them to do throughout the day. Um, adult briefs. So just adapting if this, if incontinence is an issue, or especially if you're going on an outing and you know, it might happen, this will help give them some comfort, um, potentially if, um, something to discuss with them. But, uh, a lot of times just wearing a brief when they go out will help them be more comfortable to go on outings. Um, so they know they don't have the potential for an accident. And so wearing incontinence briefs that are comfortable to them, um, condom catheters for our male clients um, is an option where um, it goes on like a condom and it's less invasive than a Foley catheter that goes in through the urethra. And um, so that it's less likely to cause infection. We use this a lot in the hospital because they want to avoid any things that might cause infection. So the condom catheter goes on the outside, it adheres um, to the skin and then they can just pee and it drains into a bag. Um, and that needs to be changed, you know, regularly, either once or twice a day. And then super pubic catheters you may have seen uh, are inserted through a hole located just above the pelvic bone. They go directly into the bladder. So, you know, we have a Foley catheter that goes through the urethra that you probably have seen at some point. And then the super pubic catheters are for longer term um, use and they're usually a little bit more um, less likely to cause an infection, a little more comfortable, um, and they can drain in a bag by their legs. So that's just something to be aware of. If they have it, we're going to try to prevent infection. We're going to try to maintain that bag when they are transferred, or especially if they go on an outing. We've got to be mindful of how full the bag is and empty it frequently. So that's something to discuss with each individual client, how they urinate. Um, medication like oxybutynin can be taken by mouth up to three times a day. And that's to help with overactive bladder. And that might help with, um, some episodes of incontinence to prevent it. Um, constipation might be caused by a lack of dietary fiber. So we can help increase their fiber by, um, blending smoothies, adding fiber supplements. Um, this is usually caused by lack of mobility or motility in their, um, gut. So um, it's a common problem. Increased weakness in the abdominal muscles uh, makes it harder for them to push um, bowel movements out. Treatments um, are with increasing fluids, um, giving them lots of fluids. If they can't swallow, we can do the thickened fluids or popsicles, things that are easier to swallow, but still get their liquids in. Um, laxatives if necessary and stool softeners. Um, Non-medicated black magic is um, just a treatment and option for them to take in that where if they don't want to take medications that might help uh, give enough fiber to help them have a bowel movement and there's the ingredient there skin issues are um, sometimes a problem because uh skin is our largest organ in our body and we have to keep the health of it but these clients um are less mobile they're usually um in the chair a lot throughout the day or they're in a wheelchair and so they're not mobilizing as much and um they're high risk for skin breakdown and so um secondary problems excuse me um cause from not being able to change positions so they're sitting in one position throughout the day something we can do to help them is help adjust their position even slightly to change the pressure point of their body 
um, laying down in the bed will help get pressure off their bottom. Um, lack of protein intake um, can cause uh, skin breakdown or it can prevent a wound that's already been formed from healing. So if any of our clients have wounds, we want to make sure we're focusing on high protein intake to help that wound heal. Um, difficulty cleaning and drying the body leaves them at risk for fungal infections. So fungal infections, you might, uh, they like warm, moist places like underneath the armpits and the groin, um, the bottom area. So that's something you want to watch out for, for any of our clients, make sure when we're bathing them that we, um, clean those areas well, and we dry them, um, dry them well before we put clothes on or, you know, the armpits, leave them up so they can air out. Um, and then if you notice any fungal infections that we notify their primary caregiver, the nurse or the physician, um, so they can get treatment for those. Um, like I said, bed sores are a risk for these clients because they aren't very mobile. And, um, but having pressure points on the body can lead to bed sores. So um, these are the stages of a bed sore. The first stage is mild redness or swelling. And then second stage is loss of the sun, some skin and muscle. Third stage is, you know, the wound is open. And um, as nurses, this is something we learned to watch out for. And the, the, the deeper this, the wound, the more difficult it is to heal. Um, a lot of clients um, that are immobile end up dying from infection to these types of wounds. So it's really important that we move our patients um, that are immobile. That's why we try to turn every couple of hours or adjust positions so they don't end up um, getting bed sores and infections and dying from these infections. Um, some actions that we can do other than changing their positions is using um, cushions or mattresses. So that picture um, a cushion can go under their bottom. This is something that the physical therapist will be able to help with. So if you notice it's a recurring issue, um, you know, they've lost muscle mass, they've lost fat, and they just have bone on the chair. And you just see red spots that keep reoccurring. That's something we can discuss with the physical therapist and they can make some recommendations for adaptive devices like this cushion um, to help them stay mobile up in their chair, but still um, keep their skin um, intact. Then um, that's something to discuss with the nurse or the care team. Um, turning them in bed when they're in bed and keeping the skin dry, clean, and good nutrition is very, very important for preventing skin breakdown. Um, ALS muscles, um, ALS affects motor neurons and the nerves that allow your brain to communicate with the muscle fibers. So as these um, motor neurons are damaged, muscles become tight, prone to spasms, twitching, and cramping. So this can be quite uncomfortable for these clients. Um, muscle cramps can come cause severe pain and discomfort. So just be aware of that um, as you're moving them, that they might be in a lot of pain and that we're monitoring their pain. Um, so things we can do to help them with that is doing some light stretching, um, like range of motion exercises are really important for any of our clients that aren't moving in the bed very well. Um, some things to note about these, you can find range of motion exercises um, online or you can be trained about them, but the important thing to do to remember is to not push against resistance. So if you're like trying to do this number and they are resisting you or it's really tight, um, you don't wanna push against that because you can cause injury um, to their muscles, but you do wanna try to move their muscles in a passive way that's easy um, as much as possible in these clients that aren't able to do it on their own to keep those muscles from getting really tight and tense and causing more pain and discomfort or contractures. Um, over the calcium, over the counter calcium or magnesium supplements will also help these muscles, um, since deficiency can cause cramping and severe, or if these cramps are severe medications, such as anticonvulsants or muscle relaxers, um, might help, or even medical marijuana, um, spasticity is stiffness or tightness, and it makes moving harder. Um, so gentle range of motion exercises will help prevent some of those, um, uh, like forgot what my dad used to call him. So my dad's a paraplegic and he, um, if he do, does not get his range of motion exercises, he will have um, spasms throughout the day and it causes a lot of discomfort, even though he's paralyzed. And so um, again, those range of motion exercises can make all the difference to them and their comfort. Um, Anti-spasticity medications such as faclofen and tenazidine um, can help with these symptoms and Botox for specific problem areas if needed. 
So pain and fatigue are common with ALS, um, muscle fatigue, it takes longer and harder to do everyday activities. So they really wear out quickly. So, um, that's just something to be aware of giving them breaks in between activities. They cannot go as long as you or I can go prioritizing the things that they want to do. So that's a discussion to have ahead of time with these clients. So you can help them meet their goals for the day. Um, Sometimes it takes two hands to raise a glass. They may, again, want to maintain that independence and work on it, and you can help them with that, but just be aware that everything they're doing is taking much more effort than you or I, than it takes you or I. Um, conservation of energy is really important, like I said, so planning the days ahead of time, helping with household chores or taking little breaks. Pain. Okay, so pain treatment. So loss of motor neurons is not in itself painful, um, but pain comes from muscle tightness and cramping. Um, old injuries return due to weakened muscles. So if they hurt their shoulder back in high school, it might come up again um, as this uh, disease progresses. Um, so just be kind to the body and try not to do too much. Remind them of that, that um, their body, you know, they don't have to have the same expectations of their body as they did before they were diagnosed. Um, Gentle stretching and massage again. And then if they do have an injury using the old Bryce acronym, rest, ice, compression, and elevation for injuries. Over-the-counter medications that might help are um, ibuprofen or naproxen, um, Tylenol, acetaminophen. Um, so that's something that they'll want to get approval from their doctor um, and they make sure something to know about ibuprofen is um, if they're taking it every day, you want to make sure that they try to take it with some food and they monitor, um, you know, get approval from their doctor about how much they take and how long they're taking it because taking ibuprofen every day, um, multiple times a day can lead to gastric ulcers, um, that cause bleeding in the GI tract. So, um, if pain is a common issue, it's really important that they discuss their treatment plan with their physician or care team. Um, like I said, always consult the physician before they treat. Um, so this disease is very, very hard to hear because you know that um, you're given a sentence, a death sentence in two to five years um, is the expectation. And um, you know, those two to five years that you have are likely going to be very hard um, as you slowly lose your function. Um, so just be aware of that, that they are dealing with this grief and sadness of not being able to see their children grow up or, um, you know, their, their life plans have been taken from them. Um, so just be aware of that and respect that they need to grieve. They need to, um, experience all these emotions, but just give them space for that. A lot of these clients experience depression, anxiety, because they know what's coming. They know they're going to lose the ability to breathe on their own, to eat and to speak, um, and so it, it can be very difficult. Um, if you notice that these clients are really going through a difficult, difficult time and they don't have a lot of support, just make sure you try to communicate that to their care team, whether it be the nurse or the physician, so they can see about um, getting them some either tr medical treatment, um, like counseling or medications, um, and then just be there as a support person can make a lot of difference. Um, so thinking and behavior up to half, Half of all people with ALS have changes in cognitive ability, um, but most of them don't. Um, but just be aware that that's something that's possible. Um, ALS with cognitive impairment um, looks like changes in their attention, their flexibility and word generation. So it might take them a while to be able to come up with what they're wanting to say, um, can still understand and have a good idea of space and nexus. Um, behavioral changes, you might see difficult um, or changes in in social interactions and behavior. Um, so just be aware of that ALS and dementia um, happens too. So they might have difficulty with um, social interactions, emotional blunting, inappropriate behavior, changes in personality, um, may still have their memory. So that's just something to discuss if you come on board and um, they have a primary caregiver, they can kind of tell you what it looked like before their ALS and what it looks like now. Um, same with any of our uh, neurological patients. Um, so there's no standard treatment for ALS with cognitive and behavioral changes at this point. Um, the best approach is to adjust the environment. So establish a routine so they get used to it, avoid risky situations that um, if you know they have violent behavior, you want to make sure that you're um, you feel safe in your environment and that you're not 
putting yourself in a position where you could potentially get harmed. Um, don't rush or challenge them, give them time and space, um, especially if they're having one of these behavioral outbursts and don't treat them like a child. This goes with all of our patients. It's very, um, could be very frustrating for our clients and for the family if they see the caregiver treating their <clears throat> loved one or treating them um, as a child. Um, so just be calm and empathetic. Try not to belittle them or, or treat them as a child. Um, so going back to conserving energy because this can make friends, um, consider what routines are necessary. Um, and timing and scheduling of the events. So if you know you're gonna be there the whole day, you can spread it out. If you're only gonna be there um, for four hours in the day, then try to you know, come up with a list from them and, and talking with the primary caregiver or the client themselves and say, what are your priorities for the day? And try to get those things done while you're there. And then any other time left over, you can supplement. Um, Set up frequently used or designated locations within reach. So if the client um, wants to maintain their independence, you want to help them by having those things within reach to melt, make their lives a little bit easier. Um, and consider adaptive devices because it really can make all the difference in their longevity and quality of life. Um, so you can discuss that with the care team or help the client discuss that with their care team. Um, so the importance of maintaining hope is huge for these clients. So, um, I have a quote from Michael J. Fox, um, with gratitude, optimism becomes sustainable. So as you might imagine, be being optimistic with this disease can be very challenging, but if there's hope, there is, um, room for optimism. So, um, one way they can, or we can help them, um, or any caregiver can help them find their hope is to take action, give them a purpose, um, with their time. So joining IMLS, IMLS, um, was started by an ALS patient. I talked about this in the last talk, but Brian Wallach, um, he was diagnosed in 2017, 2019. Um, he and his wife started IML, ALS, a, uh, patient driven, um, and, and they are there to advocate, um, and spread great information. So, and most of what I learned about ALS is from IMALS. It's a great resource. Um, and they really try to get people um, active um, in clinical trials and legislation to help provide funding for ALS research. Um, so they're a great um, resource. And then um, participating in a clinical trial, um, those are some, some options that are, are going on currently um, that, show some promising um, results in a current diagnosis where most patients hear there's nothing we can do for you and they have to go home and die. Um, it's nice to see um, some options out there coming through clinical trials. So um, thank you for your time and for learning about ALS and just any neurodegenerative disease. Um, please take the time to complete the quiz to receive your credit.